All right, just some uh, basic information. Um, today, again, Oliver will be talking to us a little bit about on the topic of future robust planning. Uh, we're very excited to see his third and final lecture um, on this uh, three-part series on business strategy for Maryland Rebooted. My name is Nicole Kim. I'm a coordinator for the Maryland Business Rebooted program, and I'll help moderate any questions you may have for Oliver today. So we ask you today to stay muted during the lecture, but please, um, any questions are welcome. Um, please use the Q&A section to put in questions that you may have, um, I'll uh, deliver them uh, to Oliver. All right, so without further ado, Oliver, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Thanks for coming. I see a, a couple of names from the previous session. So all of you who uh, joined again, uh, welcome back. And all of you who have not joined yet, and uh, this is the first time, uh, welcome. Uh, the second session uh, is also available. So if you're intrigued by the topic, if you'd like to know more about this, uh, the second session is available as a recording, so if you want to go through that. And the material that we had for session one is also available for you to download. Uh, contact us if you uh, did, uh, didn't get this or if you don't get this automatically. We're happy to share the material for these sessions with you. So um, before we get into uh, the material, every time I do the session, there's a chance for you to also uh, chime in. I'm going to use this during the session. I have three questions prepared on our uh, uh, platform here that we're using. The platform is called menti.com and it's uh, quite easy to get there. If you just, uh, you can do this from your phones. So you don't have to get away from this, uh, from this presentation. You can go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com and type in a simple password. There's no need to register or anything of that. Uh, funny things. Uh, the passcode is 9274759. So uh, that is the passcode. I repeat this, menti.com, and then passcode 9274759. So you can uh, chime in there while I speak for those of you who are notorious multitaskers. All right, back to the topic. So to today's topic is the third in the series. Uh, we talked about, uh, let me just jump right into that. We've talked about this. We had uh, two other sessions to reevaluate your strategy, to rethink your strategy. And uh, today, and I'm not sure if it's even a verb, to future robust your strategy or create a future robust strategy. Um, and it's the idea of incorporating the element of future thinking into the strategic planning process. A little bit history, uh, why I feel uh, uh, you know, very excited to talk about this. This was my work uh, before I hit uh, full-time academia. I'm what you would call a futurist. Uh, that used to be a very cool job title back in the 90s. And uh, as a futurist, you work with a couple of tools to improve the strategic planning process. And I developed a process that is mostly known as scenario planning. I didn't invent it, but I made it uh, possible together with a couple of my research friends to do this in a very efficient manner so that a uh, large organization, a mid-sized organization, a government organization can use the idea of foresight and embed this into their planning process. And you know, there's probably no time better than, than today's time to think about the future and how you can be better prepared for whatever is coming our way. And that's kind of the idea behind the session here uh, to talk about these uh, implications. So um, it, it has four parts and we wanna get, get started here. Uh, why your strategy probably will not survive contact with the future. And this is, this is something that I've often seen when I work with uh, planners in organizations that there is uh, very little future embedded into what they are doing. And, and I'm, I have a beautiful collection of uh, false predictions. Uh, this one is, is particularly nice. The global demand for automobiles will not surpass 1 million if for nothing else due to a lack of chauffeurs. And that's from nobody other than Gottlieb Daimler, who you might be familiar with as uh, one of the founding fathers of the internal combustion engine also now known uh, as part of Daimler-Benz, the large uh, car manufacturer. So let's, let's see why the strategy does not survive contact with the future. One of the most uh, critical, uh, you know, relevant things in strategic planning is that every good strategy, and we talked about this in the previous session a little bit, requires a future tense. 
You know, you have to anticipate the future and without it, there's no real strategy. The strategy is future oriented. It is not a recipe, a strategy is not a recipe to do business today or that describes your business. It is really an, an aspiration of how to achieve a certain goal given certain circumstances of which most of them are outside your control. So understanding and at best foreseeing some of this development of your outside uh, environment is uh, both what I call an art and a science. You know, there is some part of that is, is how to, uh, you know, see the future, ability, the ability to um, forecast certain, certain elements. Uh, but there's also a, a, an art to that and, the, and the, the science comes in when you start organizing this process. And the goal of bringing future and strategy together has never been to predict the future. If any of us could do this, please, uh, you know, call me. I have lots of work for you, but uh, most of us can't predict the future. And therefore what we are trying to do is either get an approximation or a range of futures. Approximation means we are trying to anticipate it as, uh, you know, close enough to what was happening or if we can't approximate it, we think of a variety of different futures and start planning with that. And uh, in, in my business, we say an exact forecast or someone who says he is an exact forecast of what's going to happen is probably as dangerous as no forecast at all because in both cases, you are clueless uh, uh, as to alternatives. And so if none of these happens, you oft, you're often missing missing the mark by quite a bit. There's also a, a risk involved. And some people say, you know, future is kind of a, a tricky business here. We can't forecast it. So what's the point, right? What's the point of even dealing with that? Well, the main point is there's a risk associated with that because if you don't envision the future and if you don't think about this, then it particularly does not make any difference which road you're gonna take to that. So intuitively, we all do this, but the, the process has to be formalized for an organization. So it has to be kind of a structure to forecasting what's happening. And I always like this, this little portion here from Alice in Wonderland, which, which shows you that it's really critical to understand at least which direction you want to take. Because if you don't have this idea of where you want to be, then it, it pretty much doesn't matter what kind of strategy and plan you develop after this. Great strategies also help you uh, to be ahead of trends. That means a good strategy helps you to be in a point in time where the current developments are leading towards. It's almost like this, uh, uh, I think Wayne Gretzky was the, the guy who says, you know, I'm not skating where the puck is, but I'm going to skate where the puck is going to be. I mean, I'm not a hockey player, but that sounded very smart. Uh, but it means a good strategy will help you to, and to, to find out where, potential future, uh, where the potential future takes you and you arrive there right on time. A quick example, every company who starts a new product or new service, from the time of the inception of that product until it hits the market, that is the minimum of minimal, uh, minimal amount of time that you actually have to predict this market. So if it takes you two to three years to bring uh, an idea into the market, you have to make sure that the idea arriving in that market at the three year time mark is actually really uh, competitive. It doesn't, it's not enough to have an idea that works right now. So any idea that you come up, you think, okay, now we have COVID and, and the, the, the economy is this in this way. Well, unless you bring a product to market like immediately, which is very difficult for anything more complex uh, these days, but you need to anticipate at the minimum, the time it takes you from idea to bring into this market. This could be two years, could be three years, because at the time you don't want your product or service be obsolete or old or kind of leapfrogged by other technologies if this is the case. So there's, a, there's an inherent need to anticipate where this is going to be. There are companies out there who have long time horizons that say car manufacturers or airplane manufacturers, their forecast uh, range is often 10, 15 or 30, uh, 30 years. You know, we have to see 
uh, where this is going. And so we have to follow early indicators. We have to, we have to find out what can help us to anticipate these trend, what's ahead of us, you know, how can you predict uh, Christmas shopping, and then, the, you know, you can predict Christmas shopping tendencies by the amount of car, corrugated paper, uh, cardboard that is being sold. You can look into the home building business and find out titanium dioxide sales, which is the ingredient in paint. The more of that is being, is being sold, the more likely uh, people will build and, and renovate more houses, etc. So we need to have this embedded into our strategic planning. Um, the one of the dangers with strategy in future is that most informations for this process will not be available to you right away. They are not available in your industry. Your industry, you're kind of moving with that industry. That means you don't see the, the, the speed and the, the direction the industry takes you because you're right embedded into the industry. So it's, it's almost like you, you're floating around. And so what you need to do in order to anticipate where your industry is going, you often find this information when you step out of your industry, you see other industries moving along and changing, you know? And so you have to have this kind of mental capacity to step out of your own kind of environment in order to see where the, where the journey takes you. And this is very difficult and very hard. And, you know, examples like Kodak and, 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 and others have shown where people were con constantly embedded in their own industry and didn't see the change that was coming from outside their own organization. You know, the codex strategy is a little bit more detailed and it's, it's not as clear cut, but it's, it's pretty much the story that Kodak basically decided not to go further with the development of digital uh, photography. Oliver? Yes. Um, just an additional comment on your um, horizon slide. Uh, Joshua is saying that Exxon and uh, other petrochemical companies also have long horizons. Um, I think this, these are just like other additional examples, but also I wanted to mention that the menti.com page is not proceeding to the second slide. So maybe you can um, address that whenever uh, you have time. Okay, let me do this. Let me do this, see if I can, can do this right away. Let me see here. It should move forward now. Okay, great, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. That's good. All right, lastly here, uh, every strategy that you know has some validity or some usefulness also needs to have a plan B. Uh, we talked about this in the last session. Um, plan B doesn't diminish, or well, having a plan B, I hear this sometimes, people say, you know, we have this great plan, we have a great strategy to move forward, uh, a lot of times startup companies are very confident about their startup strategy and people think that having a plan B or plan C would diminish the credibility and the, the, the you know, the, the genius of this plan A. The opposite is actually true in my opinion. Uh, having a plan B or plan C just acknowledges that not everything is in your, in your control and it's a, a kind of a pre-reaction to what you do when things don't go as expected. And so therefore I would always recommend to have a plan B or C. And of course, if you wanna develop a plan B, you need to have also an alternative view on where the future can go from here, right? And so therefore uh, a kind of a future view is, is absolutely required when it comes to that. So this sounds probably, yeah, okay, I get it and it's, it's interesting and, and so forth. Um, but here's the problem. The human brain is not really good at predicting or thinking about the future. We have certain capabilities to do this, but one of the things that the human brain also is involved in is the, is the process of making sense of pretty much everything. So in sense making is something that doesn't gel with uh, with the future quite well, because not everything makes sense. Not everything is clear. There's no statistics and data uh, about this. And uh, so let's, let's talk a bit about why it's difficult. So in the background, you see the, the kind of the last moving pictures of the Titanic. And the, one of the causes of the Titanic, which is often seen of, 
as one of the, the largest engineering failures. It's kind of a thing of hubris too. But the people had this problem. They had the illusion of control and predictability. It's every time a human and the human and nature want to kind of confront each other, nature usually has the upper hand. And in the, in the case of the Titanic, people believed by building it in a certain sturdy way, by having you know, watertight compartments, uh, some believe just by the sheer size of it. Uh, uh, you know, we had this under control, we can predict this, etc. And of course we saw, we all know what happened uh, as, a, as a process. The consequences is when we, then we, when we believe that our strategy is so powerful and it's the right way to do it and, and nothing's gonna happen to that, so we only have one strategy. Um, consequences are usually very unpleasant surprises and we underestimate the risk and the danger and of course, we are preventing any lack of preparedness. So that's one of the, the pitfalls when we deal with, with the future. There are also people who believe the future is pure chance, right? And, and just, hey, what can we do? It's, you know, it is what it is, or it's going to be what it's going to be. Uh, you know, those, uh, uh, those terms. And people, when, when we think that the future is out of our hands, we just underestimate uh, what we can uh, can do, and we overestimate the uncertainty. There's a lot of things that we can do regarding our influence and our choices regarding the future. You may not influence the future itself, but just by by preparing for alternate future outcomes, the future that is perceived, if not prepared as a threat, is now being perceived as doable. You know, especially when you have when you have uh, unforeseen events that we all went through, right? People who were somewhat in, 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 in a prepared mode, you know, had, uh, had a much better outcome and the, the impact wasn't affected. So if you were somebody who, you know, without any problem had a decent amount of toilet paper stored in your house for whatever strange reason, uh, you know, the whole discussion around toilet paper wouldn't have not bothered you and you wouldn't have to be forced to be you know hoarding toilet paper it's it's now almost a ridiculous story to to talk about but what it means is if we think that the future is chance we just give up control we, we surrender our ability to influence our capabilities here right and we also turn into reactive passive behavior and what we've seen not, not only recently, but every time in business when you move into reactive mode is that this reactive mode doesn't allow you to have clear planning. You always come late to the party and the passive behavior often give competitive first shot and we miss a lot of opportunities. Another problem for the human mind when it comes to futures also that we often need a, a high threshold level of engagement. You know, we wait for a crisis to hit. We, tend to ignore the weak signals, you know, discounting the future, uh, future problem. It's like, you know, if you, if you have, a, have a little tiny hole in your tooth right now, and you think, you know, it's not a fun thing to go to the dentist, even though you know it's not gonna go away, and if we continue to ignore it, it probably ends with the root canal just about a week before you go on vacation. That's usually the end game for that. And the same thing happens in business. We, if you have a very high threshold of getting kind of into action, you often uh, uh, create a situation that is much worse than it should have been. So as a consequence, we lose time to react, right? You, you've been forced to go into panic mode. Uh, the countermeasures we put in are very hastily arranged and they're not thought through. And overall, our whole management of a potential crisis or situation becomes panicky, right? And that's because we wait too long until we, until we start acting. Another pitfall is that we have this urge also to find pattern. It's part of the, the human's uh, uh, you know, need for making sense. And, and patterns have, have always been something that humans needed to make sense, right? It helps us to, to find ourselves in uncertain situations. We, we try to find out, have we seen something before? How do we act in that situation? Can we apply the same pattern? But the problem is that most of our new problems resemble old pro, uh, you know, we believe that the old problem or the new problem is the same as the old problem. And there are parallels, of course. And if you look now, okay, we have our problem now and we had uh, another flu epidemic, which is 
on a, on a much larger scale more scary. Um, so we should not compare these things. There are there's a chance that we apply what we call old recipes to this to this new problem, and they may not work. Right? We we stop using our ability to learn and adapt if we just slap on a pattern that we've experienced years before and, and very few problems are the same. So that's is something we need to be, be careful that we don't use this pattern recognition all the time. Well, and uh, lastly here, um, there's a, you know, if, if people engage with the future, if, you know, we, we can convince people to look into, you know, what's coming up. We love to find the right future. Don't ask me how many times people ask me, hey, you're a futurist, how many times did you predict the future? And I say, oh, it was, I would say 60, 40. 60% 60 of the time I was right and 40% uh, I wasn't right. And that's not a good quota when it comes to prediction. But the right question for a future was always to, uh, would always be, well, how many of this, the companies you worked for have been ill prepared for the future? And that's uh, there. My it's my my record is probably in the 90s uh, percentile, because the point of forecasting and looking at the future is not to be right. You don't want to have a predicted future, and uh, you know and people people always try to achieve that but that's that's not the point what we want to do is to create and and not limit our imagination of what the future could be because the more we keep that future open the more flexible our responses can be right we need you know and if you want to have a plan b you need to have a world b if you have a plan c you need to have the world uh, uh, version c to be adjusting your strategy and so the more you can have uh, alternative future in your head. That is kind of the skill of, a, of an experienced strategic planner. How many more uh, alternative outcomes of the future can you balance in your head and still make uh, good decisions? And so uh, one of the questions uh, that are asked here in the, in the chat, uh, in, the, in, the, in the mentee, is to look at if you can ask a what if question today, what would be a good topic to speculate from. And so this is almost the first exercise of becoming better at being a strategic planner is to start thinking in these what if questions, right? The more of these what if questions you can play with, uh, the better and the more insightful your future can be. Let me, let me switch quickly here to uh, the other screen. You should, uh, you should see now the, the platform here, the mentee platform, I hope. You can see this here on the other screen. Let me get there. Oh, come on, where's my mouse? There we go. All right, so we have a couple of questions. We hadn't made too many, but let's see, let's see what we have. Uh, uh, what if we can, can't recover business following COVID impact? Yeah, this is a critical question. Um, I would always say, okay, what are the, let's see what are the symptoms are and how can we avoid this because that's not a very favorable uh, uh, outcome. What if my company strategy starts to change fast in this time? How do we adjust and choose uh, and when to focus on? So that's, that's I think, let me, let me spend a moment on this question here, if, if the company starts to, uh, strategy ch starts to change. I, I believe you should not change your strat strategy too fast. But I think what would help in, in this situation is take a little bit more of an outlook of where the future can go into different ways. And then instead of changing your strategy, um, create strategies for certain directions, whether this is a, you know, a positive direction where you can, you know, see the world recovering, et cetera, or one where this recovery phase is longer and, and, uh, and, and more, more tedious. And so it's not the goal to create your strategy create a strategy kind of every week. That is not what we call a strategy. A strategy needs to have a certain, a certain annuity, you know, at least a year uh, or so, because a strategy should be a guideline. If, if the situation for you does not allow for that, I wouldn't probably too much ponder about strategy if you have limited resources and go to a kind of a day-to-day -day management. It's not ideal, but if the, the 
the situation is too difficult, I would step away from that. But strategically speaking, it's better to spend your time, not on your strategy right now, but to get a better idea of where could this be? Where could, where could the new business environments go to? You know, what are the alternative outcomes from today onwards? And um, there are some companies who do this work. And then I, I might be able, if you at the end, uh, if, if you're interested in, in more about this, uh, just note down my email and send me a message. I have access to some uh, uh, scenario work, which, which I explain in a little bit. Uh, that might be translated in English. It's from Europe, uh, but it might be available. So if you want to think about how the world could look like after we get over the crisis. All right. Um, yeah, transform. Somebody was transforming of educational platform. Don't get me started on that one. That's definitely a fun, to a fun topic. Uh, my take on that is uh, six months ago, everybody was thinking, hey, the future is in online education. Well, now this future came overnight and not many people like it immediately. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting take on the future of education in general. Okay, so let's, uh, let's step back here to the, to the, main, uh, to the main presentation. And again, please feel free to use the Q&A and uh, I will definitely make sure that I answer as many questions as, as possible. So for you know, the next, uh, next part of the, of the session, I wanna look into some of the tools. And this is kind of a set of activities, tools, if you will, that can help you perhaps to bring in those kind of future information into your own planning process. So I have five of those. And I want to give you kind of the, the utility of them as we move forward. So let's start with the first one, which is something we all know and heard of. And it's, it's what, what we call it, kind of casually, we call it trend watching. Trend watching is the belief that number one, your external environment, anything outside your immediate control is what we, we call uncontrollable and therefore should be part of your future outlook. Strategy should be everything that you can control. And so this is an important mental change you have to make. Everything you have under control is part of your strategic actions and everything that is outside of your control should be a, as part of an uncertain evolving external environment. Um, additionally, I mentioned this before, most of the real significant change for any industry is probably happen outside the industry. I mentioned Kodak, uh, Look at the restaurant business. The, the restaurant business has fundamentally not changed much. I mean, we had some, some you know, fast casual, we had Chipotle coming up with this, this kind of version. But the real change in the restaurant business has come from the outside by incorporating all kinds of delivery platforms. That has seriously changed the, the restaurant industry to, to some good event to some good directions and some bad directions, you, you be the judge of that. But uh, that's probably, in my opinion, the biggest change of the, the restaurant industry, um, at least de definitely after you know, food trucks hit the world. Uh, but right now, the delivery options that are out there where you know, if, if it's done right, even small restaurants can, can entertain a certain uh, you know, more remote group of people. That's, that's, that's classy. I mean, that's the big change right, right now. And many of us uh, probably have taken advantage of that. And that's why probably DoorDash feels good about their upcoming IPO. The point of catching, of, of watching trends is to catch them early. Anything you see on TV or you read about in the new newspaper about your industry and about the change that's happening, it is probably too late for you already. And so this is the tough part because you have to go to a point where you catch these trends as early as possible so you get maximum time to evaluate them and to figure out how to deal with the trend. You know, do I have to adopt my, my, my way of doing business, do I have to change my portfolio of products, et cetera. The earlier you can do this, the better. Many, um, you know, another example, we're all familiar with mountain bikes now, but the earliest mountain bikes, the idea for mountain bikes came from people accidentally watching others who have many you know, kind of, they call them clunkers. These were early bicycles where people 
kind of welded on different parts to make them useful in mountain racing or in, in, in you know, cross country racing. It wasn't even a business. It was just people, hobbyists who did this. And so the early manufacturers of mountain bikes, they were just lucky to be in a place where they found people who were so early in this process that they could actually set up real businesses after that. So you want to be very, very um, you know, sensitive to these early trends. And even if you don't catch them and, and you don't have to jump on them right now, but you need to keep them kind of in your mental model and say, okay, I've seen this here, etc. And for that, you need to get exposed to these trends. So this is not happening in a bubble. Um, you know, you need to at least these days, of course, find the right web communities or even go to go to certain places in the, in, in the events and, and, and make this part of your habit. Uh, some of you know, I, I do a lot of things with drones uh, in the university and outside the university. And, uh, you know, due to the nature of being a futurist, I always try to find out what's going on. And I worked, started to get connected with people who were these these early hobbyists and, and before commercial drones were widely available and uh, was lucky to meet people who got me into one of their meetings about almost 10 years ago when they had their self-built uh, drones on there. And, and seeing these people there, I thought, oh, this, this might be something interesting. And so for everything you do, you need to find out where can I find these early trends? Who can, who can help me in that? And um, here's a tool that you can do, at least a mental model, that you can uh, can use for that. And I call this the eight super category. It's something I developed in the days of being a futurist. This is a, a framework so that you don't get carried away with your industry or your expertise. It forces you to find out as many trends as you can potentially related to what you're doing, but to make sure that you're not going a technical rabbit hole or an economy rabbit hole. This model asks you to put trends into eight key categories so that you don't blank out on some area. And uh, the tool that comes out of this looks like this. It's, an, it's basically an octagon, if you will. It's, a, it's an octagon uh, uh, shape and uh, you can use it in a group setting or for yourself to discover different uh, trends and you just turn it around uh, so that the topic that you're working with is at the top. So what you see here is a technology trend because technology is on top and then you write them down and collect them. And um, I just wanna show you briefly because we don't have the time to go through a full process here, but that's how you can imagine people collecting uh, different trends and, and then kind of collecting them. You can do this uh, by yourself, but it's ideally a team exercise uh, to, ca to capture kind of the, the, the intellectual capacity of the group that's, that's in the room. And then uh, when you've collected a certain amount of these, of these um, uh, octagons, you can then, you know, like you see here, you put them on the wall, have the categories, and then you start voting what the team believes might be the most relevant, Etc. So that's one interesting tool that we often use to start collecting trends and some things we call them driving forces. So this is, is a worksheet we use. This worksheet will be available to you with some examples. So uh, once we send out the, the presentation for you, I'll uh, attach that and you can, you can work your way through that uh, if you're interested in doing this for your own organization. Uh, another way of working with trends once you have trends is to see, let's do an, an, an early assessment of this trend. So how do these trends impact us or could potentially impact us? And we often use a simple matrix like this where we have on the, on the X axis, we have plausibility and on the Y, we have the risk potential, you know? And so you can sort these trends into four basic categories and each category has a different strategic response model. So if a trend is in the top right hand uh, corner, this reddish area, you see these are trends that are highly plausible. So it's very, very, you can imagine that this might be a uh, part of the future. And if the trend was materialized, then you would see there's a certain risk potential for us. Risk in the sense means it could be either dangerous or it could be a potential loss of opportunity if you don't act to that. So trends in that category one, 
they should be uh, immediately taken care of. They should be, your strategy should be reviewed if, if you can capture these trends or, or work with them. And then you have category two, these are, you know, have a lower plausibility, uh, but still high risk, but it's not that, you know, it, it's not immediately clear that this will be the future. Nevertheless, they should be considered and continuously monitored and so forth. Um, number three, um, not that much of a risk potential, but highly plausible. So this is something that could be potentially embedded in your planning process. These are trends that you see, okay, this is going to happen. It will not change the world for us, but we, we want to, you know, covering this into what we are doing. And then trends with neither nor, we would put them into what we call weak signal monitoring. We are, we are asking whether this trend is, is uh, something, yeah, we keep an eye on it and see if there's something popping up, but otherwise we can, we can just continue. So that's trend watching. It's our first uh, tool. The second tool uh, is uh, kind of my, my beloved research before, and I don't want to you know, extend this beyond this, this, uh, this short demonstration, but there's a lot more to it, uh, to, this, to this topic. Uh, the topic is called scenario planning. And scenario planning is, you know, you could describe this as basically rehearsing alternative stories of the future, right? It's a group of people who's like, like in a theater piece. That's where the name actually uh, comes from originally. It's, uh, you know, a scene that you have. It's an imaginary scene. And what you do then, if you have a future that tells you, okay, this is how the world can be in five years, then you imagine yourself, well, how do we deal with that world, right? How would we behave if this would be uh, the future? The idea behind scenario planning is eventually, if you have a certain scope here, if you reveal a certain set of futures, by doing this, you become your strategy, your, your mental flexibility becomes so good that we call this a future robust strategy because your thought process allows you to very easily switch between different aspects of the futures. So you have basically rehearsed them. And when you rehearse a future, this is almost like you're going mentally through this before it happens. And if it happens, if it happens, then you are prepared. And so you use scenarios in this field where the future is very difficult to anticipate, you, you, but it's possible for you to tell, you know, it could be going this way, this way, or that way. And you, you develop these different options. And you can use scenarios for three main things. You can create what we call adaptive uh, uh, strategies. You know, that's when you have a future that is difficult to, to forecast, right? It's a very difficult future of your industry, et cetera. But you build a strategy uh, that allows you to adapt very quickly. So this would be a, an answer for the question uh, if you have a strategy that you need to change quite a bit, right? We call this an adaptive strategy. But this strategy is different. It needs to have elements there that allow you very flexible without making any large commitments to switch in different directions. So building of the strategy is the art form. The strategy itself will allow you to adapt rather quickly. You know, one consequence would be, for example, that you hire people that have proven to be uh, uh, doing well in fast changing environments. People who can adapt, people can improvise, right? You can use scenarios for preventive strategies. That means, uh, you know, you can have a strategy that allows you uh, to, you know, to move your company in a, in a position of safety. Um, you know, it allows you to switch before something really bad happens. So it's it's a it's a strategy where you try to be caution very cautionate about the the future. And the third one are proactive strategies. That is when the environment in which you are in is somewhat can somewhat be influenced by you. It means you have to have a certain opportunity here to influence the way it goes. You can be a market leader, you can have, you know, like an influencer, uh, et cetera. And you have a chance to direct the industry or the environment a, a, a little bit. And, and sometimes it's just enough for you to react ahead of your competitors. From a practical point of view, if this sounds too academic up to now, 
I uh, use this here as an example that might be might be helpful. Uh, on the top here, let's assume these are, you know, it's more than a keyword. These are stories about different worlds in which people would uh, look into healthcare, right? So these are healthcare scenarios that we did for, for a client uh, several years ago. And these, these are all different worlds that we can imagine. You know, so the first one was about drugs that are individually designed. Uh, number two, would be a pharmacy paradise that is, you know, people are on drugs and then drugs help and people appreciate them, etc. Number three would be holistic healthcare. It's kind of an idea where people move away from pharmaceuticals uh, into holistic and life changes, etc. And then number four is a medical meltdown. It's when the system as we know it is not affordable and, and, and collapses quite a bit. And so what you see here, this is the outside world. And then on the, on the, you know, in the horizontals, you see different strategies that you can do. So the scenarios are on top. And then a company, for example, who uses these scenarios can say, okay, our current strategy, we are the market leader. Uh, how do we do across these scenarios, right? And then you see plus means we're good, plus plus, oh, this is perfect for us. Uh, if holistic healthcare comes, we are, you know, we're doomed. And medical meltdown, yeah, maybe we find a way. And then you can start looking at, okay, well, how does a competitor look like, what they are doing, right? So they're, they're doing not so good in the first one, et cetera, et cetera. So if I were to look at my competitor, well, we don't have much of an edge, right? The competitor is probably worse off in holistic healthcare, but it's really nothing to, to be you know, great for. And that's when you can start now as a company to see, what if we start different? You know, what if we prepare ourselves to these futures by creating several other strategies? Let's call them plan B and C or plan two, three, and four. And we build them ahead of time. We build them as if the world would be designed drugs for number four, right? This strategy works perfectly. And number three works personally perfectly in holistic healthcare and so forth. And so now, as a company, you have, a, have kind of a playbook, you know, and this playbook tells you if the world is moving into these directions, we need to move our playbook. We need to move our playbook from strategy number one. If the world becomes the designer, design drugs, we need to find a, a transition from our strategy into the research leadership strategy, the, the purple one on the bottom. And that's kind of the idea behind scenario plane. And by doing this ahead of time, you're not only saving, you know, the stress of doing this when, if, if you were pressured to do this, you, could, you can do this now, you know, peace of mind in your quiet, you know, perfect world, but also uh, you do this ahead of your competitors and that's sometimes enough, right? You can transition faster than, than they are. And the holy grail will be maybe out of this whole work, we create our framework that tells us exactly you know, if the world changes, how we transition between these scenarios. And that would be, that would be another way. That's what we then call, start calling a future robust strategy. And that's what scenario planning uh, can do here. Number three, sandboxes. And then I have an example here from the military, but we all know sandboxes from our childhood, but sandboxes, even as a child, have this unique ability to play through multiple you know, permutations of an event or physical plan. And you see this, the military uses this in, in, in almost every action movie, there's type of a sandbox opportunity, right? Whether this is alien with 3D uh, systems or real sandbox or stick in the ground and a couple of, of, of rocks left and right. His Western movie probably had one of this. But the point of the sandbox is that you as a group can run through permutations of an event. You, what if this happens? Or if, if I can get here, what is next, etc. And keeping this physical, really a physical sandbox, allows people to change a more kind of, you know, flexible mindset when it comes to eventualities. And that is very well uh, useful when it comes about an uncertain future, because you can put the future, if you will, into the sandbox, and then, okay, what if this happens, how would we react, right? That's kind of a more hands-on version and a more ad hoc version of a more complex uh, uh, scenario process. 
and the more visual and the more hands-on it is, the more it kind of kind of gets into people's brains and they can, you know, more fluently work with it. So number four here on my, on my list is uh, strategic early warning. So probably many of you can see what's happening here, right? A little, a little birdie here. This is a canary bird. And as much as we love them for being yellow and uh, making, uh, singing nice songs, they were quite, they had a quite big utility until the 1980s, late 1980s. Because canaries in the coal mine, we know this, we know the saying, uh, they've been used to make sure that miners, coal miners would not suffocate by carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide in a mine or any other gas that would, that would probably uh, kill them. So canary birds have, uh, you know, fortunately for humans, unfortunately for the bird, uh, they're much more susceptible to uh, these gases. And so every miner or every team of miners would basically bring the bird into the mine, uh, put it somewhere within, within sight. And uh, if the bird is down, then it's high time for the coal miners to leave the mine because technical detection uh, uh, methods were not as sophisticated at that time. Nowadays, you have devices to do that for you. But so, the canary bird was always the symbol for what we call early warning, you know, get out of something before it's too late. We had our Titanic. The Titanic, the problem was not so much the, the, the building, etc. The problem was that the Titanic was also very ill measured. It had like five or six near fatal incidents before it even left for the United States. The people who operated it, including the captain, they, they all, you know, under normal circumstances, everybody would have recalled them and said, look guys, you, you guys need to know how to operate this thing. And so there are many early warning signs for the, for the Titanic not to be actually seaworthy uh, to go across. Um, IBM ignored the early warnings that they're, you know, they even work with that and, and, you know, good for Bill Gates that they didn't figure it out that hardware was not the leading cause of riches when it came to computers in the, in the early 80s. It was software, but IBM did not, did not see this because it was outside their industry. It was not something in their core business. Uh, the Challenger catastrophe is often credited with the, you know, people used PowerPoint. Uh, it's not a fault of PowerPoint that there was a bullet point hidden into a long presentation. Uh, the, the point of that is even if people read it and people were aware of that, they didn't care the shuttle needed to fly. And so the information was available to people that it would cause trouble when you fly at low temperatures or, or start at low temperatures. Uh, Blockbuster actually had a chance to purchase Netflix. Uh, believe it or not, the founders of Netflix went to Blockbuster and wanted to sell it, but uh, Blockbuster did not recognize Netflix as a you know a small startup there. What do you guys want? we are the big blockbuster guy. And I didn't see the time, uh, you know, the, the future was not written in their heads that the future might be into streaming because believe it or not, Netflix was not about shipping uh, DVDs. The ultimate idea behind Netflix was to stream it, but technology wasn't there yet. That's why they called it Netflix and not Shipflix um, when they started it. So to give you an idea what early warning can mean to basically everything, I want to show you just a little chart here that hopefully explains a little bit the benefit of a coordinated early warning system. And those, those early warning systems are not just in business. This is a business application here, but they are pretty much, you know, you have seismometers, you have hurricane modeling, et cetera, et cetera. And then we spend a lot of time and in, in, in effort into that. But the basic principle of an early warning is every signal over time that it comes and that you see to see the blue line. It's an early signal and the signal gets louder or let's call it more relevant, right? The, the, the longer we wait, the more people will actually get it, right? There's something going on. And then towards the end, it's like ringing in your ears loud. And the green line that starts at the high level and it means that the chance for intervention with any signal is very high at the beginning, right? I have a lot more, lot more opportunities to intervene when the signal is early on, right? Because I have more time, I, 
I can, uh, I can you know, interact, make a plan, etc. And so most organizations have what we call a threshold level of awareness. That's kind of the kind of embedded level by at which an organization starts paying attention, right? And some large, sometimes even successful organizations, let's, let's take Blockbuster here for a moment, their threshold level of awareness is very high. That means before Blockbuster did something different, I mean, they needed to be basically hit in the face and Netflix showing up there trying to sell their company to them with a new idea wasn't enough, right? Uh, so they detected the signal, but very late in the game, right? And if you detect the signal that late, it's, it's sometimes too late because you detect the signal and then you need actually, actually some time to make a decision. And by the time you make a decision, look at the green line at the bottom, is basically too late. Right? There is no chance to intervene. You're in panic mode, you just react. And so what do you need to do as an organization and even as an individual, you know, individual business owners? What we need to do is to lower our threshold level. You know? and that means we're increasing our awareness. If we lower our threshold level, that means the signal can be, can be detected much earlier. Right? We can see the signal very early on. And when we do this, that means we have to improve conditions for making a decision. We have more time, uh, we can think a little longer, or if we come up with an idea already, we have more time to implement it. So there's an intuitive value of looking at those early warning signals for any company because it allows us to make a decision. Well, it might be late, but it's not too late to do these uh, interventions, right? The chances are so much higher to be ahead of time. And, and I'm making no reference to our current, current uh, uh, situation we are in, but if you apply this to, to any, any kind of, uh, uh, you know, similar issues, you see the benefit immediately. So the last tool here in the, in the session for today is uh, what I would call, it's not a tool, but it's a kind of an, an approach, right? It's, a, it's an approach of how to deal with uncertainty and uncertain futures. And uh, it's called a business advance team. And the, in, in my opinion, the, these advanced teams are basically part of the, the US president's advanced team. That's where the term comes from. But the ultimate kind of the, the original advanced team here in the US could be considered Lewis and Clark, because they were sent out to figure out what uh, President Jefferson just bought, right? The, the Louisiana Purchase is there, and nobody had an idea what this whole thing was about. What is this, you know, terra incognita we just purchased? And, uh, you know, can we travel from east to west? Is there waterways, et cetera, et cetera? And so what a business advance team basically does, not just, you know, geographically explore, but it's also to explore to in increase the impact. So on the, you know, in the world of, of, of presidential uh, advanced teams, uh, these are the people who travel to potential, not even to given, but to potential uh, uh, spots that a US president would visit, both inside the country, but mostly uh, abroad. And so what they do way, very much in advance is to find out, okay, what are the potential threats when we travel here? Um, we have to do this months ahead of time. We have to monitor these early warning signs. How is the, the environment? This is friendly. Do we expect to have problems, right? What are our exit strategies here if, if something goes wrong? What are the planning? What if we actually travel to that? How would this look like? And what kind of intelligence will we need to collect? So if you're in that business uh, of being an advanced team, um, it, it can be extremely interesting, but it can also be the fact that the trip never happens at all, right? Many of these advanced teams keep a list of potential hotels and, and locations for when the president has to travel more, uh, you know, more abruptly. And so they do a ton of work way ahead of time. And, and that's what I'm kind of hoping that organizations would, would start to put into play, to have groups of people who are tasked with investigating certain strategic moves. If the environment changes, if, you know, like we had it now, where, you know, what, how, can, how would we be able to uh, uh, 
put everybody on remote work without losing the business, right? And uh, those exercises can be really helpful because sometimes being prepared is not necessarily costly. Sometimes being prepared is to put a few things in, into position. I, I recently worked with an organization um, as recently as, yeah, it was in September. And one of the questions we, we discussed in their, in their preparation was, well, what if we all have to work from home and cannot access the internal systems, right? The, the password protected system that they need to do their work. And believe me, I mean, in hindsight, it sounds like uh, we, we, we knew what was coming, but it was a basic exercise to find out if uh, a lot of people, uh, we didn't talk about COVID or anything. It's just like, you know, what if somebody, a couple of people can't make it to work because of the weather? Uh, how would we do this? And so we created a, a strategy, basically, how people, while, while maintaining a secure chain, uh, how people could pass down passwords to major systems so that people who can come into the office have access to the system on a temporary basis, not permanently, et cetera. And so the company basically created this plan B of what if you know half of us can't make it to work, but we still have to execute. And another thing we, we worked through was the idea, well, what if uh, our phone system, our internet is being, being hacked and the, the company's phones were all on, you know, voice over IP. So how do we communicate then, you know, is this, uh, what is safe and what can be done? And so as part of that, uh, you know, for people to work inside the office, uh, of course, everybody has their personal phones, but we thought they were compromised. So the company basically uh, bought uh, a set of what we, you know, in, in movies we would call burner phones and uh, with, uh, uh, with cards that can be activated. And so in case of that scenario, okay, at least 100 people have now a fully functional phone with a new phone number and could, uh, could make phone calls, et cetera. Anyways. It's one way to approach it. And this is what business advanced teams are doing for an, for an organization. Uh, those of you who were in the first session, you might be familiar with that. And I apologize, this is not a slide for presentation, but it's a slide for overview. But this is uh, one of the things that a business advanced team should be organized with. You know, you should kind of slice your horizons, your action horizons into different sets. This might be a lot of work if you're an individual business owner, but if you have a few people around you that you can plan with, you're already there. And of course, large organizations should be able to do this all the time. You should basically slice up your time horizon into these, into these steps. You need to look at what is needed to do in the next week, next month, next quarter, next year, and then perhaps as the next new normal. And different people need to work on that. And for large organizations, I highly recommend that the executive team doesn't even touch the next week, next month, and perhaps not even the next quarter. This is something they should not worry with. This is, this is something what an organization needs to do just to make it through the time. But the you know, decision makers, the strategic thinkers need to already work on the longer horizon because otherwise you will always be behind. And so personally, if you're a small business owner or you, you, you want to organize your own world a little bit, uh, uh, more strategically, you know, slice up your, your decision making into these sections, you know, what, are, what is necessary to do next week, next month, next quarter, next year, and so forth. All right, so let me see. Yeah, um, I have two more things and then we're going into Q&A and then and, uh, we, have, we have time for, for free questioning anyways. Um, so a couple of takeaways here from the session that I hope will well, at least spark some ideas in, in you. Uh, number one, uh, I believe that organizations should include and incorporate really strategic foresight as a business function. It's not, I, I don't think that is an option. I, I thought before COVID and, and after COVID even, even more. We should think about more about those eventualities. If this event proved one thing that a very strange scenario in which we're living through uh, actually can happen. Right, and it's not just speculation or a science fiction movie or whatever. And so we should have a more expanded uh, imagination here, what could happen. Number two, I think you should look into, you know, at least mentally creating 
different future out, you know, different futures. What, what could the world look like, right? Like play this at least in your head and then see, look at your strategy. Is this a strategy that's based on a kind of a sunny side of the world scenario that only works when everything is in your, in your favor? If that is part of your strategy. Is that really a strategy? In that world, everybody can be successful. The real proof of strategy is what if, you know, this strategy gets kicked a little bit by things that are unexpected? You know, is it still working? Is it robust? Can you bounce back? Do you have something in there? And therefore, in order to be better at this, I suggest two main kind of retraining, rethinking activities. For individuals, it's about resilience and changeability. How many people, you know, are able to switch what they're doing on a dime, you know? And, you know, in our, in our world of education, we have to, not all of us, but, but some people have to switch immediately from, you know, lifelong delivery in the classroom to an online in, in environment. Some of us has done, have done this before. It's not that hard of a transition, but others, they will really struggle. And the same goes for students too, right? They went to school all their life and it's really different to learn online versus, you know, being on social media online. Um, improvisation, I think, is a major new, new talent uh, that I will teach in, in, in many of my uh, classes, and, and I do this for organizations. The, the idea here about this organization that is now having burner phones and, and, and passport, uh, password uh, strategies, this was an improvisation exercise. By doing this, we increase our comfort zones. Every time your ability, your, your ability to change or to adapt if you can do this, your comfort zone gets bigger. That means you're more comfortable with situations that would be uncomfortable for others. That's the main goal here, that we have just more flexibility to deal with a different environment. On an organizational level, I think companies need to think more about preventive measures. Uh, you know, what if? What if this happens? How, how are we prepared, right? And spending more time in crisis prevention than crisis management, right? There's, there's a lot of things that go into crisis management and, and so forth. I would rather work on the crisis prevention. It's not as glamorous, right? There are no heroes in crisis prevention, but it's a much better way to spend your dollars. And then for businesses, something like redundancies and prepping. And, and, and redundancies means, we, we've seen this with the toilet paper, this, the example, right? There's just one, uh, one supply chain that, that supplies, uh, consumer toilet paper and it's separated from the supply chain for commercial toilet paper and you know if you only have one supply chain uh, as a as a company well it might be more efficient but it's definitely not a redundancy uh, i know companies in the you know year decades ago um, my grandfather's business was in carpentry and he, he always retained uh, two or three suppliers for the same material and he kind of switched them over because he believed that, you know, anytime I need something more, a special favor, at least I have three people to ask uh, for, for those things. And then, you know, the, some of you may have seen these prepper movies, you know, the people who build bunkers, etc. That goes too far perhaps for, for, for an individual taste. But businesses also need to think about this, that having a fully streamlined business where everything is squeezed out for profitability, it doesn't leave you room for this redundancy. You know, there's no secret closet that has surprising supplies left over. No, it's all squeezed out, right? And you miss, you know, and, and, and doing this streamlines you so much that you are that you're in, in, in trouble. Probably the most visible metaphor that I can see for that is people who go on these uh, survival shows on, on TV, right? Naked and Afraid is one of, of those. And you see, you know, these people really in shape and, you know, they've trained for that, showing themselves off being on these shows. Yeah, and it looks good on TV and they, they all look healthy and everything. But, but really, if, if you're on a survival show for three weeks, what you, what you should do is you should put on 20 pounds of weight before you enter because, you know, you can still be fit, you can still do your exercise, but you need to put on weight because that, you know, provides you some cushion when you're short on food. And it's kind of a, maybe it's an ugly picture, but that's my mental model for being prepared for those unforeseen events. All right. Uh, 
let's open the discussion. I want to tell you a quick story and you tell me, and that's when we can, I think, open, uh, open the chat uh, functions uh, even more. So this is one of my, my favorite stories that I've seen in real life, well, not seen, but I, I heard it uh, from a person who did this. It's a story about an old fur trapper. And this fur trapper was, spent most of his life uh, in a cabin somewhere in the mountains, in the Rocky Mountains. And actually somebody was tracking him down. I mean, he was trying to find out what happened to that person. And eventually they, they caught up and, and there was a news reporter and he had an interview with this guy. And, you know, among other things, uh, the trapper showed him how he prepares for the winter. You know, he has to do fire, he has to do firewood. And his strategy was kind of counterintuitive, I think. Uh, because what he did is, you know, there were plenty of, of, of trees in the, in the area close by to his hut. You know, it was a lot of, a lot of trees, a lot of big trees. So there's plenty of potential firewood there. But what he did every year when it came to making firewood, he would take his sledge and go as far away from the cabin that he could, cut down a tree and came back. And it was very tedious and a lot of extra work went into this process. But every year he did the same process. And the uh, question now is, why did he do that? Why did he go out every year as far as he could go away from the hut and uh, cut the wood far away? And Nicole, I'm not sure if we can capture that in the Q&A, can we? Um, let me see. We don't have anybody putting in answers yet, but. Anybody an idea? <laughs> can activate somebody. Let's see if somebody has an idea. I'll wait 10 more seconds, see if somebody can. Uh, to keep his mental and physical sharpness. All right, that's not a bad idea. That's actually not, that's not, not bad. Well, another answer, so that he would still have the wood in the dead of winter that was close by. Okay, that's not bad either. It's cl getting closer, it's getting warmer. To limit his exposure. Okay. Um, and while he has healthy, he could go far. Yes. Now that goes very close because his, his strategy was basically he, he anticipated a scenario by which he would like to stay in the woods and, and perhaps die there eventually uh, at some point. But if he get older, his ability to go out and cut the wood would diminish. So he, was, he had decided to do the hard work, the extra work, while he was able to do this, so that when he needed an emergency, and the idea with the winter is good, uh, as a good fur trapper, of course, you should never run out of wood, that always two years ahead of time. But if he would be somehow you know, not able to go out anymore, then he could uh, cut down the trees that were close by to his thing. And that's kind of the mentality here is being prepared. And you see, um, talking about future preparedness, this is not like an easy thing to implement. This is, doesn't come without effort. Uh, this is usually an investment in time, etc. But at the benefit of having a much better shot at things when things go really downhill for you. you know? So let me uh, just stop here this share. Let me let me uh, switch over to our other platform here for a second because I had put in one more question and, and thanks for a couple more in here. Let me see what we... All right, so we had a few people who wanted to speculate two years from today. What do you think will be the most important changes to US consumers? <laughs> no job in hand, yeah, that's, that's sad. Hopefully not, you know. Uh, ease of use and durability combined. I think durability might be an interesting concept, right? Having, you know, moving away from products that have sh shorter life cycles. Okay, limited first-hand factory research available during planning processes. That might be something. Uh, the use of e-commerce. Yeah, e-commerce might be almost almost a whole different uh, different model there. Flexible service models. Okay, so the question now that a lot of people have, okay, what's the, what's the lasting impact of what we felt, you know? Is, is everybody becoming a prepper now? Is everybody, I mean, we've seen, and I mentioned in previous session, we've seen some 
consumer behavior, people actually bought refrigeration. I mean, you know, freezers. A lot of people have, have who had the, had the ability to buy freezers. So will we have frozen food delivery in the future? I'm not sure if this is coming back because in the 70s and 80s, I was familiar with many of these fruit de uh, delivery uh, there. I'll give you another one. Uh, I think, uh, you know, since I have to throw one in here from the drone world, I think the future of delivery is not even drone delivery. I think the future of, of delivery is going to be drone pickup. And so if you have a house or an apartment or whatever, uh, instead of waiting for your Amazon drone to do the delivery, you just send your drone out to pick it up. I think that model makes more sense. And while flying out there, picking something up, they can also drop the, drop the dry cleaning off and, and, and so forth. So of course, this is a little bit in the future, may not be everywhere possible. And we probably might not like to have drones buzzing around overhead all the time, but you know, and, and that's, that's something that, that could be there. But you know, a lot of consumers, uh, I see a couple of those those earlier uh, earlier trends, you know, maybe maybe people see their house in a different way. There was a lot of trends where where people uh, and I, I actually work with a large apartment building company, and we always speculated the future of of apartment buildings. And their future was, you know, we need to have, you know, the 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 apartment oh, the apartment buildings where you know where uh, get together places and and um, you know the size of these places were were kept smaller so that people had more community space in these apartment complex you know that might be something completely to rethink uh, and now with the viruses etc you might you know in that industry they're already speculating what kind of amenities do we need and and perhaps one major amenity would be small cubicles where people can do remote work. You know, I have a green screen, like I have a green screen behind me and camera set up. Maybe that's a new amenity uh, yeah, out that, there. That really coincides with one of the comments that I'm seeing. So one person suggested maybe the development of home offices is the future. Um, oh yeah. I yeah. mean, for real home office. I mean, we we not just not just you know a laptop on the kitchen table. That's not a home office. But uh, nowadays, if you want to work from home, there's a little bit of equipment almost uh, required to to perform remotely. You know, mm -hmm. and so that those might be other concepts. I'm I'm not sure. You know what the future of companies like we work is. Apart from that, they had a problem before. This is not a COVID problem. But, uh, you know, how do we think about community workspaces and, and things like this? Maybe there are neighborhood models. Somebody has a basement and people come over for video conferencing. I don't know if that is, that is something. But anyway, so this, there are good things to uh, speculate. And thanks for filling out this, this little survey. A few people uh, did this. Um, you know, that's a lot to ask from me because I know these tools for incorporating future are not as, uh, common and this is something definitely uh, new to the to the planning uh, and environment and the last time these these tools got a got a severe boost um, historically was during the oil crisis in the 70s that's when some of these tools actually uh, uh, came up and the, the the other push into the tools were in 2000 after the big uh, dot-com crash so every time we have these kind of unfortunate, un, unprecedented events, people really start thinking about it uh, and think, okay, what can we do the next time around to, to not run into this particular problem? Okay. Any other questions on, on your end, Nicole? Did any, any other questions uh, pop up? No, not right now. So we have uh, a little bit of time. Um, to do, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to you know, answer a couple of questions if, if something is, is coming up. But in general, um, I can, for, for those of you who will receive the, the, this, this overview, I'm gonna attach one or two worksheets for you that you might uh, wanna try some of these activities. Probably the best way to, to start going is really doing a little bit of a kind of a trend watch. What it does also, this trend watching it, it forces you to read 
the news in a little bit different way. I mean, not the day-to-day -day political news, but news in general, news items, and, and consume them in a different way. Because what you're looking, if you, if you push yourself to be a more kind of a futurist, what you're pushing yourself is, what can I filter out of a news item that gives me kind of an early indicator? What in this news item tells me about things that are to, to happen three to five years uh, from now? So be, me personally, I'm not too much interested in the things that happen next week, next month. That is, you know, it's kind of, kind of uninteresting for me. I'm interested in things, okay, what's down the pipeline uh, two, three years uh, from now? So in our environment here in, in education, What's the future, right? Is, is the certification model that Google comes up, is that the future of college, you know? Will people, you know, in the future pay, pay uh, less for an online degree? You know, all those questions that circulate now in the, in the media, you know? But, you know, that thinking, believe me, I did three, four, five years ago. Uh, it's difficult. And if you're a person who does that, um, please, and I can share that experience with me, very few people will listen to you. They only listen to you when it's too late. And unfortunately, uh, some of the thankless part of their job is to remind people all the time, you know, and you have to be a little bit persistent if you're not the person in charge, but be persistent. It pays off, at least for your own mental health. It helps a lot if you keep people uh, reminding them, hey, let's think about different models. Let's think about alternative way. Let's have a plan B. Uh, uh, etc. You know, and it it can make your decision making and your strategic planning so much more effective. Yeah. Um, and Oliver, we got some interesting questions in the meantime. Um, and so one question was, um, what kind of consumer trends do you foresee for the future? <laughs> Just a question. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, we, we mentioned a, f a few here uh, uh, at the at the same time. I will I will think that people will start very seriously thinking about putting emergency funds together. This is something the, the media often discussed and, and you you know you hurt people living paycheck to paycheck. And I know this is a this is a silly discussion right now when so many people financially are in pain. But if you're not and if you get out of this pain, the, the reaction should not be okay, let's spend it on X, let's spend it on Y. And, uh, but instead, how can I have a certain, you know, certain cushion? And I, I, I'm telling you, I mentioned this to, to many of my graduate, I mean, students who graduate. I said, okay, you now from, from having no job, you're getting a job, do yourself a favor and, and put away enough money for, for three to six months, not because of savings, et cetera. But this money means that you can shift your career when you have to, that you're not dependent on the outside world to be nice to you. And, and, and if that, that outside world doesn't develop in the direction, the company doesn't go in the direction you want, that you give yourself a six months period by which you can maintain life as it is and have all the capabilities and all the resources so you can switch into a different direction. And that's kind of what works on that model. I would see also in the consumer trends, and I think a lot of businesses uh, could jump into that, into this area of uh, how can you make your life a little bit more predictable? You know, how can we put things in, in place? And this might be even something that companies can do in, in some way as a benefit to, to people. And, and, and I'll give you an example. I come, come from, from Europe, from Germany originally. And our legal system is much more favorable for an employee. Uh, it's a very difficult for a business owner, and I experienced this as a business owner, unfortunately, to fire somebody uh, unless it's a major cause. But firing somebody over a decline in business is, is very difficult in Germany. And so with what we've seen here, we were not even a week or two weeks into, into the shutdown mode and the millions of people lost money. There is, there's no cushioning in there, right? The companies immediately release people or many, many, many have done this, many tried not to. But this could be something where people in the future may not are willing to take a lower income against the guaranteed 
continue payment clause, right? That I have a three months or I have a two months war guarantee here, a kind of a payment plan that kicks in because many people see now that the, the, the government su supplied uh, tools may be not sufficient, you know? So there might be some of these uh, things that come into play uh, for consumers, you know, to, okay, mm -hmm. let's try not, let, let, what can we do to prevent this one? Right. And kind of related to this, um, related to the question of what kind of trends do you foresee, another question that we had was, should companies instead create trends instead of just um, predicting and sitting by? Well, can you repeat the last part of that? Oh, should sorry. they create, create trends? Yeah. Um, you know, I wouldn't say you can create trends. I, I think, um, I mean, trends are being created. It's, it's a cumulative ex exercise where a lot of activities together kind of get in tune, right? It's, it's like a harmony by, by a lot of activities. And a lot, a lot of times these trends now happen globally in, with all the exchange of information. Um, if a company creates a trend, and may, it may not be a trend. And, and, and maybe there's an influencer on, on YouTube who, who can push certain things. But for, for companies in general, I wouldn't want to spend too much time on these trends because you have to create the strengths inside your industry and that might be not long lasting. Instead, I would like to increase my viewpoint into areas that I don't spend usually time in it. You know, how many, how many of us, you know, if, you in, in, if you're an older person, you know, meaning, yeah, you see your, your, your teenage children or kids work with social media and it's influencers. Most of us would say, oh, these guys are, you know, nutcases or that sort of influence and K-pop and, and whatnot and, and pootie pie and, and uh, I don't care, right? But you should because this are these, these are the places nowadays where you see things evolving, you know, it may not be all mainstream yet, but this is where you need to spend, uh, pay attention. So if you want to do predicting consumer behavior, this is where you have to have an ear on, 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 on those things and, and find, or at least find people who can have an ear in that and can translate it. What does it mean for us? Can we either jump on that opportunity or does it threaten the way we, we do things, right? And the larger these organizations we are, the more ignorant are, are, are those organizations towards those tiny little things that pop up. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and we have two more questions. Uh, sure. So one question was, um, in your opinion, do you think USPS will survive or go into a privatized model? Huh, you know, I hate not, uh, this, is, this is too political for me uh, to, to answer uh, and I stay away from that. The, the only thing I would share, and this is not my opinion, but it was an interesting analogy where somebody said that you know, the postal service is a service and therefore it's not supposed to be profitable. And somebody compared this to the military because nobody, and he said, you know, nobody says the US military is losing $950 billion every year uh, as a service, you know? And I think that that had some, at least, uh, you know, we can see now with the, with the voting uh, models out there and beyond voting, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a transport of our tax returns, et cetera, delivery of medication, et cetera. We have to see how much are we willing to, to put this on. And then, yes, privatization is a model, but it's also, you know, a model that doesn't always work. And I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm in a business school. I'm a big fan of, of, of market economies. Um, but my personal view on the, on the privatization of pretty much everything is, it's not always helpful. I came back from Morocco this year from this from a trip there from a student trip. It was last year, last year in January. We came back in January. It was a snowstorm in DC, right? And so we landed at at uh, at, uh, at Dallas, and we're trying to get a taxi. And of course, uh, the taxi default nowadays is an Uber, but none of the Uber guys wanted to drive because it was a snowstorm out there. It was horrible. It was dangerous to drive. And of course, it's an opportunistic, opportunistic model. And so there was almost no Uber driver out there. There were like thousands of people at the airport. You know, yes, it's a, a mandatory taxi service had some benefit at that moment, if you will. Um, and so similar for the post, uh, postal service, I think there's, there's room in every government, especially government-led 
uh, industries for optimization and automation. And I think I would, I would more approach it from that angle. I think it's anybody who looks at a service like the poster office as a, okay, can we optimize this? Can we include market principles? Can we include efficiencies, et cetera? Yeah, why not? Why not? You know, but again, that's just in a business point of view. Politically, I leave this to people who like to do the map throwing. Um, so a less political question. Um, in the current environment, there seems to be a lot of attention on crisis managing, scenario planning, et cetera, what you were speaking today. Um, but this person is curious about your thoughts on how long do you think this awareness might last and then people will just return to underfunding um, future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, there are two things that get get really interesting when things hit the fan. This is future, the, the future and creativity. Both of these things are highly in demand when nobody has uh, time and money. So this is what I teach. So I'm always in demand when nobody has time and money. And so there is a certain amount of, you know, um, a certain amount of we will we'll get back to normal, but I don't think we're getting too far into into normal. This might have a more lasting effect. I mean, we can see the lasting effect of 9/11 still when we go to the airport. I mean, taking off your shoes and etc. It's lasted now for many decades. I mean, decades. Uh, and so there might be elements here where where even companies need to make a better argument to people long for or the long term to invest. I think this might perhaps initially hit startup firms to a degree where investors may not be that willing to jump in into an opportunity just because it looks good, but may ask, okay, what if you're doing if this is happening? And what are you doing if that is happening? So a little bit more strategic agility hopefully might might last, you know. It doesn't take take much. I mean, it's it's like if you have a little room, take an extra pack of toilet paper from now on, and uh, you know it helps you down the road. All right. Hopefully, it doesn't get more political. That's that's not my area. <laughs> there further questions? Okay. So we're good. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for for. Uh, for tuning in today and uh, some of you know me you know how to reach me and uh, those of you uh, who don't know me I think the information is in the it's in the slides and I think uh, I'm closing out here uh, thank you for coming I hope this was uh, informative useful uh, check out when we send out the links to the to the session and the material and I'll leave it now to Nicole I think I have the slide here I need to Need to switch my share because there's one more announcement on what is next. Yep. One second. All right, you should see it. All right, perfect. Thank you. Signing so off. <laughs> Thank you so much, Oliver, um, for your super insightful webinar. Um, and this concludes Oliver's three-part series on strategy for our Maryland Rebooted series. We would really like to take a moment to just express our gratitude to Oliver um, for really kicking off the Maryland Rebooted series so successfully and making the three-part strategy series so engaging and insightful. Um, the Maryland Rebooted program is offered an effort to help Maryland business owners navigate the impact of COVID-19. And I, th I think I speak for everyone when I say that the webinars have really been um, just like a time for me to think through how businesses could handle these um, in certain times and yeah, it's just what kind of uncertainties what we could plan for the future as well. So on top of that, it's just been a, a joy to tune in. It's just been very entertaining. So thank you again. Um, and before we let everybody go, here is some more information about our upcoming webinars. And as you can see, we have some very exciting speakers scheduled for the next webinars. We have Dr. Eugene Cantor sharing his knowledge on accounting. Dr. Mary Harms will talk a little bit about marketing during this time. Um, also, finally, we, we have a very exciting panel discussion planned with um, Andy Shalal, um, who is the CEO and founder of Bus Boys and Poets um, on September 15th. So we welcome you to join us then. Uh, so please sign up for these webinars. Um, please visit the same page, the Maryland Rebooted website um, that you use to sign up for this current webinar. Um, and I'll share the link uh, for this website on the chat room again. 
Um, and also finally, please note that we do offer masterclass courses if you're interested in learning a little bit more specifically about the specific topics. Um, and that link is also provided um, in our website. All right, so thank you everyone for attending. Um, we'll see you in the next webinar. And that's it for today. Thank you so much, Oliver. Thank you everybody for coming. All right, thank you. All right. Special thanks to, I see a few people checking in from Germany. Thank <laughs> you guys, thanks for coming.